Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we dive into the enigma of Russia and the challenge of Putinism. In the second half of our show, former world chess champion and democracy activist Gary Kasparov explains why he believes Vladimir Putin is more dangerous to the United States than the Islamic State. Up first, TV producer Peter Pomerantsov describes his experiences inside the Russian propaganda machine and its role in supporting the world's only nuclear-armed kleptocracy. Peter, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me on, Bill. Peter, I just finished reading your book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, about life in Russia these days. But before we get into that, give us a little bit of your background. Sure. I was born in Kiev in what was then the Soviet Union in 1977. But when I was just nine months old, my parents were exiled. They were political dissidents. Mm -hmm. My father was caught distributing Solzhenitsyn and Nabokov novels. Nabokov. The Gulag Archipelago, an invitation to a beheading, which then was a crime in the Soviet Union. And after a long series of arrests and interrogations and various political petitions, he was exiled. And so I ended up growing up in London, really by accident. My father was given a job at the Russian service of the BBC. So I'm an accidental Brit. And I lived in Britain and then a couple of other cities in Western Europe pretty much all my life until I finished university. And then you made your life as a TV producer. Yeah, I mean, I, I did a few things first, actually. I mean, the first thing I did was work in a think tank. Uh, I was started life in policy. And I came to Moscow for the first time in 2001 mm -hmm. to work in a think tank, to work as a consultant uh, for the EU to kind of help reform Russia and make it democratic. Mm -hmm. But very soon I found politics boring. I went to film school in Moscow and then I became a TV producer and a director. Went back to London for a bit to get good at it and then very quickly came back again to Russia to work inside the sort of the booming Russian TV industry, which at the time was the fastest growing market in the world. Uh, it was very, very exciting. Russia was in the midst of the oil boom. This is around 2006. Mm -hmm. And I spent the next sort of four or five years working with Russian entertainment channels, um, getting to understand what makes 140 million Russians laugh and cry, uh, what kind of Western formats uh, would work out there. So that's probably the difference between my book and all the other books about Russia. It's a story I tell from inside uh, working in Russia and being inside what became this vicious propaganda system. Well, you know, one of the things I like best about the book is it looked like it was just a series of anecdotes and short stories and, you know, true-to-life tales that let the reader form conclusions. And it was, you know, quite chilling, actually, by the time you're finished with it. I'd like to start with a quote from your book, if you don't mind, which I think sets the stage very nicely. In a country covering nine time zones, one-sixth of the world's landmass, stretching from the Pacific to the Baltic, from the Arctic to the Central Asian deserts, from near medieval villages where people still draw water from wooden wells by hand, through single factory towns and back to the bluegrass and steel skyscrapers of the new Moscow, TV is the only force that can unify and rule and bind this country. It is the center of power, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that Vladimir Putin did once he came to power in 2000, I mean, before he took over the energy, before he took over the oil, before he tried to reform the army, he got rid of the oligarchs who control TV. So two in particular, Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Gusinsky. Mm -hmm. He put one in jail and then kind of let him leave the country. The other one kind of fled the country. But he took their TV channels away and he bought TV under complete and utter centralized control. I mean, it's, it's, it's a control that's really maybe hard to imagine um, in the West. I mean, literally the heads of the main TV channels are called in every week to the Kremlin and told. Here's the story of the week. Yeah, well, the, the, here's the story of the week. I mean, much more than that. What's going to be the pseudo fake Kremlin directed opposition, what they're meant to say, what the sort of the spin on the story is. It's not just the story. It's much more than that. It's hmm. uh, the whole uh, you have to sort of imagine that uh, sort of the news in Russia is scripted like in a movie with sort of heroes, anti-heroes, twists, turns, three-act structures. It's, it's quite, you know, it's quite sophisticated. And, and they play both sides. Yeah, I mean, this is the whole point. So, I mean, in Russia, you have like a simulacra of democracy. So you'll have, uh, you know, you'll have different forms of puppet opposition who are all directed from inside the Kremlin. So you'll have the crazy right-wingers and the crazy left-wingers. And they go on the debating shows, and the point is to make Putin look kind of reasonable and normal by contrast. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, so it's, it's a movie. It's directed like a movie. It's talked about like a movie. The people kind of writing it are a mixture of old-school KGB guys, 
and really kind of contemporary TV producers. So it's a very artistic approach to authoritarianism. I want to dig more deeply into that, but before we do, remind us the arc of governance in Russia from communism to chaos to the gangsters and the oligarchy to where we are today. Just sort of lay the, lay the milestones down. However, perestroika started the fall of the Soviet Union, and it was actually an elite process. It wasn't a bottom-up process. It was a process by the elites to reform the country, uh, which kind of got way out of control mm -hmm. when the Soviet Union fell apart. Then you have sort of several sort of different political models, you know, one after another, in sort of this fast-forward kaleidoscopic uh, chaos. So you have a period of sort of freefall, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early 1990s with bread queues, with a threat, real threat of the country just falling apart altogether. Then kind of the gangsters basically took control. I mean, on a regional level mainly, but they were the glue that kept society together. You went to the gangsters to sort of sign your business contracts. Then around the mid-90s, mid there's a more centralized control, but it's really manipulated by these uh, financial barons, the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a bunch of them kind of rule and control everything in the country. Then that fades away, and you have the emergence of Putin and the beginnings of this, you know, postmodern dictatorship that he's created. But it, you know, it's it's like having a hundred years of history squeezed into ten years. And this really has nothing to do with communism. This is just tyranny on the modern stage. There are links to communism in the sense that one of the defining things of communism was this incredible belief in propaganda. I mean. At the bottom of Marxist theory was this idea that through propaganda, you could remake man, you could remake society. And that has remained, but now it has nothing to do with communist ideology. Now it's done in this very kind of contemporary way, this mix of reality shows and authoritarianism. And there seems to be a faux capitalism behind it all. Well, listen, there's definitely, um, there's like the worst bits of capitalism. Uh, you know, there's uh, <laughs> huge corporations who, who are not answerable to anyone but the Kremlin. Uh, there's some of the veneer of capitalism. You know, there are private banks and, and some private, some pseudo private institutions, Stock but market. there is no concept of private property in Russia. So somebody might think they own something, but it can be taken away at any point by someone in the Kremlin or a bureaucrat. So it, it takes the worst bits of feudalism and the worst bits of capitalism and, and puts them together. So Peter, how did you get into the system there? There was a big demand for sort of London-based or, or American-based uh, professionals. So whether in banking or in uh, in architecture uh, or in TV, there's loads of Westerners coming in trying to like you know mm -hmm. make it in this new, exciting, emerging economy. So I was part of a wave of Westerners coming in. But TV was sort of. Um, uh, I mean, my first meeting in TV, I, I remember, was very memorable. I was taken to a meeting at the sort of the nerve center of, of the propaganda machine, which is um, housed in a building called Ostankino, this massive building mm -hmm. where around seven TV channels live. Uh, and right at the top uh, of the building, there's once a week there would be a, a meeting for like the cleverest sort of spin doctors and PR guys and TV guys in Russia. I was taken along by a friend who was a publisher. And, and literally people would just sit around going, like, how are we going to do the news this week? You know, we need a new enemy. Uh, you know, the, the politics has got to feel like a movie, but everyone knows nothing's going to happen. Everyone knows Putin's going to be in charge forever. But we've got to create sort of, you know, pseudo opposition movements and, and a pseudo rebellion somewhere in order to keep kind of the storytelling alive. And mm. it, it was bizarre, this incredible sort of mix. It was like sitting in a script, a script meeting. Brainstorming, right. Yeah, but, for, but these people were doing news, but they were treating it like, a, you know, like a, uh, like a movie. Uh, and they were going to write all this and create all this. Uh, it was quite shocking for me coming from the West where, you know, news would usually look at the story of the day. And there's a character that emerges fairly large in your book named Surkov, which you, you say directed Russian society like one great reality show. What, what was his role in all this? So Surkov is one of Putin's closest sort of advisors and still is. He was one of the first guys to get sanctioned recently by the U.S. for his part in Crimea. But uh, when I first arrived in Russia, he had a very fairly humble official name, deputy head of the presidential administration. But essentially, his job was to run the whole of internal politics. So he didn't touch military stuff. He didn't mm -hmm. touch you know, the big oil money stuff. But he directed the great scripted reality show of pseudo-political parties, everything that went on TV, the whole drama of society. His background was very interesting. Um, he started off as, uh, he studied theater directing at school. <laughs> He's a bohemian. He writes lyrics for rock songs. He writes for very avant-garde novels, usually about corrupt PR men. He was one of the most successful PR guys in Russia in the 1990s. Then he joined Putin's election team. 
So uh, the modern version of the new Soviet man. Yeah, yeah, but an esthete and, and incredibly cynical. Uh, and, and he would sort of openly say, I have created the new Russian system. He gave it a name called Sovereign Democracy. So, Peter, I'd like to ask you about the nord ost theater siege. We saw bits of this in the West, and, and it, was, it was quite a horrible experience for all involved, but it provided some lessons to the propaganda machine. Remind us what that was all about. So the nord ost theater siege was fairly early on in Putin's reign. Basically, a group of um, Chechen terrorists took a whole theater hostage. The mm -hmm. people in the theater were watching Russia's first musical at the time. Uh, they held them there for three days. There was a huge showdown. At the end, the military managed to slip in some uh, sleeping gas mm -hmm. in the theater, knocked everyone out. So it, was, it looked like the perfect operation. They managed to go and kill all the terrorists. But then they hadn't prepared the ambulances properly and they hadn't warned the doctors. And so I can't remember how many, but I think almost over 100 people right. died as a consequence of the sleeping gas they put in. They didn't get the antidote. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't know what the, well, they didn't tell the doctors. They didn't, the doctors didn't know what the hell was going on. They didn't know what to do with them. They'd done the military operation perfectly, but because they are so, I guess, so systemically inhumane in their approach, they haven't thought about, you know, what they should do with the victims. Mm. So it ended up being something that was a victory that turned into a disaster. And it was all on TV. Well, this was the thing. This was still at a point when Russian TV, bits of Russian TV was still quite anarchic. And it was all on TV. The terrorists got to go on TV. They would make sort of live... Uh, appeals mm -hmm. to you know to end the war in Chechnya, and they'd let everyone go. Uh, the whole thing was an absolute mess. Everything was shown on live TV. Everybody was sort of glued to it. And after that, that was a real moment that TV would be brought under much, much, much firmer control. I mean, it already was under a lot of control in terms of opposition politicians and so on and so forth. But after this, it was going to be everything was going to be micromanaged because this was such an incredible disaster. It was a never again moment. Exactly, exactly. And it also gave them the excuse to do a lot of stuff. So after that, they're like, right, you know, we've seen terrorists manipulate our news cycle from now on. You know, we're going to micromanage everything. Do not even think about doing anything before you consult the Kremlin. So it was a real before and after moment. You know, they learned the lesson very, very well. Um, by the time we come to the next great terrorist disaster, Bestland, the media is very, very strictly controlled. Best time was when a whole school was taken mm -hmm. hostage by some Chechen terrorists, when, again, another complete and utter victory stroke disaster, when the special services raid school, tens of children are killed. So when one newspaper showed a photograph of, of, a, of a wounded child, the editor was fired. Yeah, that was the end of that. So your book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, is chock full of so many stories. We can't touch on all of them here, but I'd like to go through a few one that I found quite chilling because there are shadows of this going on right now in the United States is what you call raiding, uh, actually spelled R-E-I-D-I-N-G. Tell us about that. So raiding is the Russian sort of much more ultra-violent version of U.S. corporates raiding, spelled with an E in Russian. And, and basically it's when you take over somebody else's company but not by sort of buying them out officially. You basically use the secret services and the police. You buy them off and you basically arrest the other person while they're on some trumped up charge. Mm -hmm. While they're in jail, you steal their documents, sign the whole company over to yourself. By the time they've come out, they've lost their company. This used to be done by businesses on businesses. Uh, what we've seen the last 10 years is that bureaucrats initiate this themselves. So, you know, bureaucrat X wants businessman X's company. One morning, businessman X wakes up to find that the tax authorities are there. They put them in prison. By the time they've come out, they've lost their company. So it's a very, very brutal form of corporate takeover. But the start of it is, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Completely. I mean, the attitude to the law in Russia is very much that. Law is seen as an extension of power rather than a, mm -hmm. a place for justice. Nobody thinks about it in Russia as a place for justice. Guilty verdicts like 99.99%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a tool with which to hit people with. And the question is, can you, you know, sometimes you can buy your way back and you can pay more than the other guy. But if you're being attacked by uh, a high level bureaucrat, then, you know, your chances are very, very low of survival. You mentioned one chemical company that had been in business selling a certain chemical for years where all of a sudden that chemical was deemed a controlled substance. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the most corrupt agencies in Russia is the DEA, uh, you know, the Drugs Enforcement Agency, partly because they, they seem to be involved in the narcotics trade. But 
another favorite ruse of theirs is taking sort of you know any kind of pharmaceutical and when they want to take over the business of the people trading in it they go oh this pharmaceutical we've just made it illegal uh, mm-hmm. which is bizarre. let's say you're trading genes and suddenly genes are illegal mm-hmm. so the woman i follow I, I focus on a sort of a successful businesswoman whose business is attacked this way and, and really her story is about someone who lives a very bourgeois very western existence goes on holidays in italy mm-hmm. has a nice car a nice apartment the whole kind of western lifestyle and then boom she wakes up in the real Russia and uh, she wakes up in prison in this completely Kafkaesque situation where she's being told that everything she's done for the last 10 years is a crime. Mm -hmm. Is selling cleaning solution. Yeah, she's selling cleaning detergent, uh, importing it from Italy uh, and selling it to factories. Mm -hmm. So one of these really boring jobs that brings in a lot of money. Uh, And these guys just want to take a company over and this is the way they did it. The story focuses on two things. It's really her personal journey. She thought that Russia was normal and she'd, she'd woken up mm-hmm. uh, in a country where there was absolutely no law. And, and that was a frightening thing. She had nothing to appeal to. The, the charges were so absurd and so ridiculous. She doesn't know what's grasped. She feels that she's going mad because, uh, you know, suddenly every, every bit of ordered life around her doesn't make sense anymore. It's Kafka come to life. Completely, completely. So that's part of it. But then she kind of worked out who was trying to take away a company. And it was one very powerful bureaucrat. But he had a very big enemy, another very powerful bureaucrat. And her way out of this chaos and out of this nightmare was to kind of play one bureaucrat off the other, which is often the only way to survive in Russia. I mean, appeals to justice are very important. But um, at the end of the day, in a system where it's, you know, big dogs eat big dogs, then your only hope might be getting another big dog on your side. Which is really a little taste of feudalism. Yeah, I mean, not quite. I think I think feudalism uh, is actually when there are laws. Feudalism was very strict. <laughs> the laws in feudalism were very, very strict. That was the whole point of it. Russia never really had feudalism. It had a patronymic system where the Tsar owned everything in theory, but was never actually strong enough to take it. So the barons would pledge fealty, saying, everything I have belongs to you. But in, in, in real life, the Tsar could never actually take it. Much more a system based on what strength you really have and personal deals, oral personal deals. Feudalism is actually quite structured. Feudalism has kind of codes. That's a good Russia point. You know, you state in your book that Moscow can feel like an oligarchy in the morning, a democracy in the afternoon, a monarchy for dinner, and a totalitarian state by bedtime. How do people keep track of what's going on? Right. I mean, this is kind of the challenge. I mean, Putin is not a monolithic authoritarian. He's constantly changing the rules of the game. So you have to be very, very nimble. Uh, one minute they, they do do some mini bit of democracy. You know, so the last Moscow mayor elections were pretty open. The next minute, it's like almost Stalin era um, pressure. So the person who, who survives in this system is the person who can shape shift the fastest, uh, the person who's most supple. And that's almost become like a sort of a cult of, of, of a certain type of personality in Moscow. Uh, that's why the book is called Nothing is True and Everything mm-hmm. is Possible. Uh, it's all about being able to shape shift and change language and change your position and change your belief system at a moment's notice to keep up with the latest trend. Well, you know, talk about latest trends. One of the things we've been exposed to here in the technology community in Boston is a project called Skolkovo, which was pitched to us as a sort of a Russian Silicon Valley looking for cooperation with the West. Do you have any insights into what that's all about? Sure, I've been to Skolkovo. So, yeah, Skolkovo was conceived of at the height of the Russian pro-Western course, which was very recent. It was between 2008 and 2012. We had a president, Dmitry Medvedev, who was incredibly pro-Western, wanted Russia to modernize. The buzzwords were democracy and modernization. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, of course, they're sort of conservatism and uh, nationalism. But Mm -hmm. there you go. Things change in Russia in a couple of seconds. Uh, And Medvedev initiated this project uh, to create a sort of top-down Silicon Valley. It would be sort of um, a region, uh, sort of a small town, basically, Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be that would house uh, lots of tech companies that would be tax free that would attract foreigners you know you see the plans for it and this it's this beautiful utopia with uh, you know people going around in sneakers and wind sailing and sort of high tech architecture i have to tell you it really appeals to central planners here in the us and those who think they can pick technology winners and losers yeah i mean in, in russia it's a bit more of a tomkin village because i went there i went on a tour and you know you see this beautiful video and then you kind of get there and there's nothing there. You know, there's <laughs> barren trees and, and mud. Uh, and you drive for hours through this mud and you're like, oh my God, there's actually nothing here. This has been going like three years now and they haven't built anything. And then in the middle, there's one building they've built, this very futurist, modernist kind of Danish style building. 
very minimalist, which looks bizarre in Russia because Russian weather doesn't actually respond very mm. well to that sort of architecture. Uh, and it's just standing there in like, you know, in fields of mud. Uh, and that's as far as they've got. Uh, and there are rumors of corruption. But it's like it's, it's Russia is great at this. It's great at creating these illusory Potemkin villages, which never really come to anything. But which often, not that I'm making any allegations about Skolkovar itself, mm. which are often great mechanisms for corruption as well, because, you know, it's great to have a huge project that the government invests billions in and no one's really responsible for the billions. We got a fair share of that here, too. I mean, in terms of the American attitude, I think it's, it's an item of curiosity what's going on in Russia. But the concern is external threats. We've seen what's happened in Crimea. We've seen what's happened in the Ukraine. How does this expansionism fit with the rest of Putinism? Well, it's, um, it's, we have to understand how propaganda-driven it is. Basically, Putin needed a new story after 2011, 2012, when hundreds of thousands of people came out onto the streets to protest against him. That mm -hmm. was sort of the end of this simulacra of democracy, because there's only so long you can kind of do a fake democracy before people want a real one. Mm -hmm. So th that kind of like, you know, that drama was over society and, and Putin needs to think of a new one. And so way before Crimea in 2011, 2012, the new one they pick is war. War is a story. So since 2011, Russia has been at war with America. America doesn't know about this, but on Russian TV, it's nonstop. America is out to get us. America planned the protest here. America mm. is to destroy us. Uh, we're at war with America. This was just done as a propaganda, a spin at first, just to give a new story to the country, to make people forget about corruption, to make them forget about bad governance and do this, you know, it was framed both as a geopolitical battle, but also as a civilizational battle. So the corrupt, gay-loving West is out to get conservative Russia. Complete rubbish. Russia is, you know, one of the most atheist countries in the world. <laughs> They're extremely hedonistic. But it doesn't matter when you're doing right. stories. People are just meant to watch the movie. They're not meant to believe. They're not meant to live it. Mm -hmm. They're just meant to have something to watch on TV. And then Ukraine came along. Mm -hmm. They obviously didn't plan it. I mean, you know, this was, this was a stumble. This was a, you know, they didn't expect the Maidan to happen. Suddenly, again, this risk of next, you know, in a, in a country right next door, you have an anti-corruption revolution that's incredibly dangerous to Putin. And suddenly what started off as propaganda became reality. And suddenly we have a real war on our hands. And this is sort of the danger. Putin is militarizing his rhetoric further and further. We can hear it now quite openly, you know, when he's saying that, you know, America and the West is trying to destroy Russia. Mm -hmm. And the danger is that when you tell stories about war and when you invest in the military to kind of back up those stories, yeah, they come true. The real fear is you end up you end up drifting into a real one. Uh, so it's that it's that weird trick of propaganda. You know, you can do propaganda for a long time, and then at one point, illusion becomes reality, and that's everyone's great fear. Not that Putin has some great plan to invade the Czech Republic, but that he'll stumble into a war in Azerbaijan or in Latvia or in Bulgaria or in Kazakhstan. And that we will be pulled into a real conflict. This is a real fear. So that's the first point. The second point is, again, very connected to the propaganda, is that we saw in Ukraine a level of disinformation that I don't think we've ever quite seen before. Uh, the closest, actually, is maybe Edward Bernays' sort of trip to Guatemala in the early 50s, where they, you know, where basically the US invented a, a communist coup when there mm. wasn't. But that was a fairly small operation. And, you know, it stopped after that. Here we have the Kremlin inventing the reason for a war by claiming the fascists have taken over in, in right. Kiev and that they're threatening the Russian population. We see real people going down to the Donbass and fighting who are being armed secretly. But this has really been a war driven by disinformation. And the journalists who go down there is just surreal. You know, they talk to the local fighters there, the rebels, the separatists. And they're like, and separatists are like the fascist hunter is coming to get us, and they're, and they're like, there is no fascist hunter. Like, <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. But it's crazy. You know, we've seen spin. We've seen sort of you know Colin Powell sitting there and trying to pretend that there's WMD in Iraq, but at the end of the day, it is. It does come. Those lies are very quickly exposed, and we come back to a reality-based conversation. Here we have people living inside a hallucination, permanently. It doesn't stop. And so that's absolutely frightening. That's the real danger. This is, you know, what happens when you have mass television, when you have social media, which we thought would be an instrument of liberation, but it's actually turned out to be the dictator's ideal brainwashing tool. So, Peter, this is quite chilling, but there's probably much to be learned from it. What are the lessons here for the West? I think we have to understand what's happening in Russia is an almost caricature reflection of what we see in the West. So in Russia, there are two things happening. There's this 
underlying ideology that there is no such thing as truth. And this has come out of a late Soviet cynicism when no one believed in communism, but pretended they did. And then it was kind of strengthened by disillusionments and reforms and so on and so forth. But the roots are Western postmodernism. Exactly. We've had our own journey to a very similar mindset. In Russia, it's a million times more radical. And we see what happens when it's taken sort of to, to the nth degree. We don't have a war in Crimea, but here we have the war on women, and we get these storylines that propagate in the news that take over politics. Yeah, no, 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 we, we, we have a very, very dangerous situation. Russia is almost what happens at the other end, if you don't have that sort of core reality-based conversation. I mean, we see it in Donetsk, actually, more than anywhere else. People in Donetsk, that's in eastern Ukraine, they mm -hmm. don't believe Russian propaganda necessarily. They don't believe Ukrainian. They just don't believe anything. And they sort of, sort of invent their own reality, which is a surreal sort of like folkloric thing. So... Russia is awash with conspiracy theories, you know, uh, mm -hmm. nobody believes necessarily what Putin's telling them. So everyone's kind of like believing in sort of hidden hands and plots. We see this trend in the West, yeah. especially yeah. Europe, as we lose faith in our institutions, people don't become wise, they just become kind of like unhinged. So Russia in that sense is a very extreme version of sort of the cynicism that we see in the West. Cynicism doesn't lead to wisdom, cynicism just leads to sort of conspiracy theories and and the loss of any kind of faith in anything. So, Peter, let's hope that your book serves as a cautionary tale and puts us on a, a better course. Thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure. That was TV producer Peter Pomerantsov, author of Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. To send us comments and feedback on this or any of our past shows, visit realclearradio.org and click on the email bill link. Real Clear Radio Hour is a partnership with Real Clear Politics, which the New York Times has called an invaluable tool for anyone interested in politics or public affairs. Ahead, former chess champion and democracy activist Gary Kasparov looks at the foreign policy implications of Putinism. Stay tuned.